we for this session and we have, we have an exciting lineup of panelists and discussion as well as a steam organizer and collaborator who have made this event possible and thank you everyone for joining us tonight today we gather to delve into the concept of chineseness in southeast asia our distinguished panelist Zhuang Wubin, a writer, photographer, and curator, has undertaken extensive work in unravel and unraveling the intricate experience of Chineseness in the region through photography, oral history, and ar archival research. Zhuang Wubin, not only an accomplished photographer, but also an insightful writer and curator. His passion lies in exploring how photography intersects with modernity, colonialism, nationalism, and intricate dynamics of Chineseness in Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. Wubin notable, notable, notable works include Photography in Southeast Asia, a survey, and Chinese Muslim in Indonesia. Today, he will take us through his compelling projects, particularly Chinese Muslim in Indonesia, and Chinese in the small towns and rural areas of Southeast Asia, uh, revealing the connection between Chineseness, religions, place, and class. Joining us as our esteemed discussion is Dr. Fiona Lee, a literary, literary and cultural studies scholar with a profound understanding of decolonization, the, the, the global Cold War, and their resonance in the literary and artistic realm. Dr. Lee's expertise shines through her research on Malaysia and the Asia-Pacific, exploring themes of post-colonialism, critical theory, and cultural studies. Her published essay encompasses a wide range of subjects, including Malaysian literature, art, cinema, and culture. We look forward for Dr. Fiona very insight. Okay, about the presentation today, Zhuang Wubin will pre presentation will take us on a journey through the captivating realm of Chineseness, focusing on his work Chinese Muslim in Indonesia. He will delve into his motivation, methodology, and key findings. Through his lens, we will discover how photography becomes a method of documentation, creating a collaborative space for both the sitter and the photographer to express their desires. This performative aspect of photography will be connected to broaden themes of sociological fieldwork and the cultural evolution of Chinese Muslim leaders in the post Suharto era. The interplay of subjectivity and photography provide a fresh perspective on the concept of Chineseness within Indonesian Chinese Muslim communities. And I would like to acknowledge the organizer and collaborator who have made this enlightening enlightening event possible. Our heartfelt gratitude goes to Pusat Sejarah Rakyat, Ikri, an organization dedicated to archiving, research, and collaborative process project, which is recently a uh, current project. They are doing demo Sejarah Lisa protest 2007 until 2022. And their publication, Toko Toko Pejuang Rakyat, uh, stand as testament to their commitment to enriching our understanding of history from the ground up. Additionally, we extend to appreciation to for the book club Kuala Lumpur, founded in 2013, a vibrant book club foster active engagement and meaningful discussion about photography and their collaboration at depth and insight to today's discourse. As we embark on this journey of exploration and insight, I encourage you all to engage actively with our panelists and discuss it during the Q&A session. Feel free to use the chat box uh, in our Zoom or Facebook comments, and we we will we will compile it and then we utter it during the Q and A session. Without further ado, let's begin our exploration of photography and Chinese in Southeast Asia. I now invite Zhuang Wubin and Dr. Fiona Lee to take the visual stage and share their perspective. Thank you. Okay, I think I shall begin. In the interest of time, uh, thanks first to Faiza for the wonderful introduction. Uh, thanks, uh, Zikri, for inviting me to uh, present my work. And I would like to thank Fiona in advance for the discussion. Let me just share screen first. Uh, my, is my slide working? Faiza? 
Yes, it's working. Okay, good. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to actually share a small part of my work. Um, so I'm I, I'm working on different aspects of um, the experience of photography in Southeast Asia and how photography intersects different experiences in Southeast Asia. And one of these uh, trajectory concerns photography and Chineseness. And in this trajectory, actually, there are different components to the project that I'm working on. Uh, but today, I'm going to primarily talk about my work as a photographer in this uh, aspect of looking at photography and its connection to Chineseness in Southeast Asia. I don't intend to be very academic today, but um, in order to slightly foreground what I'm going to speak uh, later, I'm just going to slightly uh, explain a few terms that I might be using in um, the presentation. Um, we know, of course, when we write about photography, we are in a way dealing with the photograph. And in the way I conceptualize my work, uh, the photograph is one possible outcome of the photographic encounter. What is the photographic encounter? So let me take you a little bit behind the scene. So this is actually a body of work that I will talk about in the second half of the presentation, which, is, which deals with Chinese in the small towns and semi-rural areas of Southeast Asia. So in few work, what typically happens or would be that I would appear, I would go to a place, um, and then I might um, do an interview, a short interview with a person. Um, and then I will set up my camera. Uh, in this case, I'm using a very old camera, a medium format camera, an analog format. I set up the camera and I make a photograph. And this is actually the encounter that results in the photograph that is being made. So this is a photograph, as you can see, made in Donggong in Sabah, Malaysia. So this is the photographic encounter that I want to foreground right at the start. Um, there, there is, it's quite common to assume that, um, uh, it's quite common to assume a certain kind of power relationship between the photographer and the photograph person, uh, in which the photographer is seen to be all powerful and the photograph person is seen to be a helpless victim in the encounter. I wish to caution against such a paradigm um, because if you work in a particular way, very often what happens is that there is an intense negotiation that takes place during the photographic encounter. So here, I'm going to give you another example that comes from my work. Um, here, I visit a fishing village called Legong in Sumanup. So this is on Madura Island. Um, of Surabaya, East Java. So Sumanup is a relatively underpopulated, very dry, arid place. Uh, so I arrived at this fishing village. I located a, um, a family that runs a small convenience shop at a junction. So I interviewed the gentleman in the photograph, Sajono. And after the interview, I said to him, I would like to take a photograph of your family. So in his family, you know, he has Sajono and, you know, his second wife, and then they have a kid. So I said, can I, can I make a photograph of the trio as a family portrait? And his wife said, no, uh, it's very pantang to put an odd number of people in a photograph. Either you photograph me and my husband, or you photograph, you know, like two person. You cannot put three person in an image. It's very pantang. It's very unlucky. So in the end, I have, to, I, have to, I have to agree with what her demands are. And I actually made two photographs, right? So the first photograph is Sajono with his wife. And then the second image is uh, Sajono with, the, with his son. I mean, if we minus the cat as the, you know, the third character in the image. So that, what I'm trying to say is that there is always a kind of negotiation that happens during the photographic encounter, which, in which the photograph person, in fact, project the desire her or his desire into the encounter. And the outcome is a photograph. And by looking at the photograph itself, it may not be apparent that there is a kind of negotiation that has happened. So here is a kind of uh, visualization of what I'm trying to talk about. The photography encounter 
really concerns the photograph person and the photographer. And today's context, because everybody has a mobile phone. So what happens is that the photographer, upon arrival at a certain place, may become the person who is being photographed. And in my work, I understand documenting as something that's collaborative, performative, and embodied. I will maybe talk a little more as I show you the examples later. But what I want to, at this stage, maybe foreground is to say that the photography encounter may or may not result in the making of photographs, but the encounter nonetheless exists. And the encounter is really an experience between two bodies, two or more bodies. So it is actually a kind of embodied experience that connects two or more different bodies. So tonight I'm going to talk about two bodies of work that I've made. Um, and actually I'm going to mainly focus on my experiences in Indonesia. The first book is titled Chinese Muslim in Indonesia. It's made between 2007 and 2009. In 2011, it was published by Select Publishing in Singapore. I'm just going to very quickly take you through how the book looks like. Uh, uh, you know, it was also published in Taiwan in a kind of uh, magazine that focuses on cultural geography and human geography. So the story was published in February 2010. An earlier version of the, ex of the work was actually shown in the culture, the Language and Cultural Center of Rabaya, East Java, in Indonesia in 2008. So this is how the exhibition looked like at that point in time. The work actually changed a little bit later. But anyway, this is how it looked like in 2008 when it was exhibited in Surabaya. Later on in 2015, it was actually shown as part of Surabaya Photo Festival where the work was actually exhibited in one of the most, let's say, posh shopping mall in Surabaya. So in this work, you will see I went, I visited certain places across Indonesia. And the project is basically divided into three components, three parts. And the first part contains a focus on the first or second generation Chinese converts. So I would go and track down first and second generation Chinese converts, interview them, stay with them for a few days and photograph them. The second component deals with pre-boomy Indonesians who are open about their real or imagined Chinese ancestry. And so this part is really interesting because uh, we know for a fact that um, Chinese Muslims have been living in Indonesia for uh, even before uh, Admiral Cheng Ho visited um, the area. However, today if we visit Indonesia, we are only able to see first or second generation Chinese converts. The, 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 the older generation Chinese converts eventually merge with the local population. So in order to show that part of history, I have to locate Pribumi Indonesians who are open about their real or imagined Chinese ancestry. And also to revisit the history, I also made it a point to visit historical monuments, the Kramats, and also to visualize some of the myths that's associated with these Chinese Muslim communities uh, that were already evident uh, in the area. So in conceptualizing the projects, there are some things that I tried to keep in mind. Um, and of course, what I wanted to do at that point in time was uh, to try to reach out to researchers and to use their work as a kind of guide to my work. Um, and when I was photographing, I was very mindful of the fact that I want to resist the temptation to rely on certain stereotypes regarding Chineseness and Islam. So I wanted to refrain from overemphasizing the rituals, the symbols that's related to Chineseness and Islam. And in a way, I also try not to frame the photograph persons as Chinese Muslim. I was more interested uh, in the fact that in, in how they interact with the surroundings, the neighbors and their colleagues, uh, so as not to reduce their identity into a singular Chinese Muslim identity. I also tried to take a long-term approach. I located people who were open to my project. I interviewed them. I photographed them over a few days. And then usually what I would do is I would go to some other place and then I would revisit them after a few months. So this project took um, a period of time to complete. It was done between 2007 to 2009. And finally, I, had, I focused on the mundane and unremarked in the daily lives. Uh, here I borrow from Caroline Knowles uh, from her text, Seeing Race Through the Lens where she talks about photography's capacity to reveal the unspoken and the unspeakable aspects of routine lives. 
making it a useful tool to capture race as a kind of live performance. Race as people do it rather than how people verbally articulate about it. So these are some of the considerations that I had, that I had when I began the work. Okay, enough of the conceptualization portion. Let me just show you some images and maybe bring you through some of these uh, um, experiences that I had uh, while working on Chinese Muslim in Indonesia. So an important place that I, I visited was Bangka Island and Palembang. And, and these two areas are historically connected um, because the Palembang Sultan used to be the person that actually administered Bangka Island. Bangka, of course, was famous for being a, an important tin producing uh, area. Um, I first met Marlena uh, in Jakarta. In fact, she was, um, she was working then as an English teacher in a tuition center. Eventually, she would become a, a principal. Uh, and she was by then already a Chinese Muslim. She already converted. She converted um, uh, when she left her hometown in Bangka. And then when she was studying in Java, she was looking for her religious faith. And in the end, she found Islam as a calling and then she converted. So her conversion story is a little bit different from other Chinese Muslims. Uh, many of the Chinese Muslims convert in Indonesia because of marriage, because of the need to marry another Muslim. And so hence the need to convert. So Malina's conversion story is a little bit different. I photographed her working in Jakarta and eventually when um, her family back in Sunai Liat in Bangka Island uh, were to observe the passing, the one year passing of her grandmother, I also visited, I also followed Malina to visit her family in Bangka. And so here you see Malina performing rituals for her grandma surrounded by her uncles. And what is, right, what is quite interesting about this image is that um, on one hand, you see a Chinese Muslim performing uh, rituals for her grandma. Uh, but at the same time, it is important to note that many of her uncles are also converts into Catholicism and Christianity. Um, and they feel that you know, performing this ritual is only a kind of a, a sign of respect to you know, the, 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 the late grandma, her late grandma, and does not contradict her faith in Islam. Uh, as we know, Bangka Island uh, is, was during the Dutch era at least, was a major uh, team producing area. So, and we also know that uh, the first pioneers of tin mining in Bangka were Chinese uh, or some of them, many of them Chinese Muslim. So what I wanted to do is to find a reason, what I, want, I, what I tried to do was actually to find a reason Chinese convert uh, who was still involved in tin mining. As we know, tin mining uh, is no longer as lucrative at this present stage as compared to the past. But I tried to locate somebody who was still involved in tin mining uh, and who is also a convert. And then I chanced upon Ji Qi Xian or He Qi Xian. Uh, so he was originally a Confucius believer. And in his case, he converted to Islam because he wanted to marry Sulistiani, which you see uh, in front of him, uh, Sulistiani actually came from Java. She was originally hired to be a domestic helper for, for uh, G's aunt. And then after the aunt passed away, the aunt left the house uh, to Sulistiani. So this is actually, this image is actually taken in the house. The altar that you see dedicated to Mazu is actually, was actually left behind by the late aunt. So this is actually, um, the small mine, the small tin mine that G um, owns. And because of work, you know, like tin mining is a work that requires G to be in the field. Uh, it's of course quite dirty. Um, and it's actually often very, he often have to soak himself in water. Um, so like other miners, right? He is actually not adverse to having alcohol. And also like other converts, he feels rather uncomfortable praying in the mosque. Um, and this is actually quite a common experience among converts. Um, they relate the experience of thinking that other Muslims might be looking at them praying. Uh, and in most cases, the wife, um, 
becomes the first teacher of Islam. And in this case, Sulistiani is actually quite understanding to her husband. And, and, and she, she told me that she understands that in, in, it, it would actually take some time for him to convert. So conversion is actually a process. So this is the oldest part of Bangka, and, which is called Mentok. And you can see a sense of the architectural um, features of the old city. It's a very small, quiet city. And the oldest temple is built right beside the oldest mosque in Mentok. And it gives you a sense of maybe race relationship in a place like Bangka where it is really common for, uh, it's really common to have intermarriages between the Malay and the Chinese, uh, historically speaking. So um, it's very, very common. For instance, if you find a Malay family to have, for instance, a Chinese grandmother or a Chinese great grandmother in the lineage. Um, and in a small place like Mentok, we get a sense of maybe a kind of racial connection or racial relationship of the past during the Dutch in this in a small town like uh, Mentok. And at Mentok, I tracked down Abang Faiza, who at that point in time was the owner of a restaurant right beside the Mentok bus terminal. So according to his family history, Faiza is a 12th generation descendant of a Chinese Muslim who happened to be go by the name of Lim Tao Kian. And this person, his sons are credited for developing Mentok, the oldest part of Bangka. So I asked Faiza to bring me to the, the kind of royal cemetery, which you can see is not really kept in a very good condition. Um, and I have him pose in front of his ancestor's um, tomb. And according to his family history, Lim Tao Kim married a princess of the China court. And then both of them fled to Johor, and then where they then converted to Islam, and Lim adopted the name of Chek Wan Abdul Hayat. Abdul Hayat. And then they had five sons, including Abdul Jaba. And this Abdul Jaba married the daughter of um, the Palembang ruler, Sultan Mahmud. And that's how you know, the connection between Bangka and Palembang was stained. Now, it's in uh, the reason why I was interested and was aware of the, uh, a person like Lim Tao Kien was, of course, based on previous research done by scholars. Um, but frankly speaking, it's really uh, difficult to search or verify whether such a person actually exists. So if we look at the dictionary of the Ming biography, there's only a mention of somebody called Lim Tao Qian. Uh, in the Chinese records, he was a native of Chaozhou, started in as a clerk in the Jig Court, and then became a pirate along the coastal regions of Guangdong and Fujian. So by 1578, Lim had moved his operations to Cambodia, Siam, and Patani. And the Chinese records do not have any information about his escape to Johor. And of course, it doesn't record any conversion. So we, I mean, so it is impossible to prove whether Lim Tao Qian is Lim Tao Qian or Lim Tao Qian. Um, was really the ancestor of Abang Faiza. But what I'm really interested in is why would Abang Faiza repeat uh, this story to me? So that's actually the more interesting aspect of um, working and interviewing people in the field. Um, yeah, so I'm more interested in why he would tell this story to me. Um, and it's the, the broader context in Indonesia is that I think uh, for most people who have already convert, um, they would try not to overemphasize their Chineseness. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, let me take it back. For most of the pre-Bumi, if they under that they have Chinese ancestry, they would actually try not to uh, talk about it. For instance, in his family, uh, in his extended family, there are around 1,000 uh, members related to his family. According to Abang Faiza, um, most of them do not want to talk about the, the possibility that they were descended from Lin Tao Chen. It's only his family and maybe some of the people closer to his family that would talk about it. So it's really interesting to speculate why he would want to relate this story to me. And from where 
his restaurant is, which is the bus terminal, which is right beside the harbour. Uh, Mentok is connected to Palembang. The, so this by ferry. And so the ferry sustained the historical connection between Mentok and Palembang. And at Palembang, you will see temples like Chandra Nadi, was, which was established originally in 1733, originally dedicated to Mazu. But behind the main altar, there is actually a tomb dedicated to a Chinese Muslim navigator. And so um, the non-Muslim visitors would, of course, pray in, in the temple. They might also pray to the, to the tomb of the Chinese Muslim navigator, but they may not know about you know, the person. The Muslim visitors would actually also perform rituals at the tomb itself. Uh, and in Indonesia, it's, in Indonesia, it's actually very, it's not uncommon to find a syncretic space like this where, you know, there is an Islamic tomb inside a Chinese Confucius or Confucius or Taoist temple. And in Palembang, I met another person. His name is Kiagus Muhammad Idris, who also claims to be the ninth generation descendant of three Chinese captains who fled to Palembang at the fall of Ming Dynasty. And he claims that at least two of the captains are believed to be Muslims, which is, of course, a claim that we cannot verify. He also actually introduced me to a relative, which was at that point in time doing a thesis, if I don't remember wrongly, doing a PhD thesis, trying to prove the ancestry of his family. Um, and in local terms, if Kiagus Muhammad Idris walks around in Palembang, most of them, most of his neighbors, his peers would take, would take him as a Palembang means Malay. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting to me that he tries to tell me this uh, story of being descended from Chinese Muslim captains, um, which is a claim that we cannot really verify. And if we want to speculate on his desire, so if you remember the encounter, right, the photography encounter where the photographer comes into a contact with the photograph person. And I mentioned about the idea of embodiment and performative. And if we want to kind of speculate on the reasons why he would um, tell me this story, I would actually suggest that um, by connecting his family to uh, Chinese Muslim captains, it gives his family history a, you know, a certain uh, sense of importance and it allows him to prove the fact, to me at least, an outsider, you know, somebody who has come from elsewhere, it allows him to tell, to show that Islam is inclusive in his understanding, that it is possible to be descended from Chinese Muslim. And then it also allows him to articulate a certain kind of loyalty to Indonesia and to also show that they are very pious Muslim. So I think that is possibly one reason why he would actually tell me um, such a narrative. He actually, in fact, also brought me to the tombs uh, where the Chinese captains are believed to be buried, even though it's very, it's of course still impossible to say for sure whether um, those were tombs of Chinese Muslims from Ming Dynasty. Um, we leave Bangka and Palembang to come to Java. So um, a, a substantial part of Chinese Muslim in Indonesia takes place uh, along the Pasir Sir, uh, the northern coast of Java. And here I'm just going to talk about two examples, one coming from Surabaya and one Surabaya, which is here, the second largest city in Indonesia, and then also the old city of Tuban. And at, at, and at Surabaya, I met Yusuf Bambang Sujano, Sujanto, who is actually a very prominent leader of the Indonesian Chinese Muslim Association. Uh, he was also the founder of the Jingho Foundation, which actually built the Jingho Mosque. Um, there is a perception in Indonesia uh, where people believe that only poor Chinese convert to Islam. Um, and of course, in Bang Bang's case, that's not the case. I mean, he's involved in uh, all sorts of, um, I mean, he's in state uh, manufacturing. Uh, he's also involved in retail. And he 
also a very prominent leader of the Chinese Muslim Association. And he was actually the mastermind of the Chinese Muslim, um, uh, well, he was the mastermind of the Qing Ho Mouse in Surabaya, which was inaugurated in 2003. And you can see that architecturally speaking, the mosque resembles, at least on first sight, a pagoda. And it's actually inspired by the New Year Mosque in Beijing. Um, and using the work of um, political scholar Hugh Wai Wing from Malaysia, um, he argues that this manifestation of Chinese Muslim cultural identities does not reveal actually an existing ethno-religious reality, but rather brings a new reality into being. In other words, um, during Suharto period, um, the common the common um, idea would be uh, the, the common idea would be that uh, if uh, the common proposition at least was that if uh, if the Chinese would convert into Islam, um, eventually they would uh, they would merge with the pre-Bumi population, and then that would be a way to resolve um, the Chinese problem. Um, but after the fall of Suharto, it became much more easier for somebody to be both Chinese and Islamic. And so um, people like Bambang Sujanto is a big advocate of creating a kind of Chinese Muslim identity where you can be both Chinese and Islamic. In other words, when you convert, you don't have to abandon your Chineseness. And Bambang Sujanto is actually a big opponent of um, a, a big proponent of this proposition and the building of a mosque like Masjid Jingho in Surabaya and also the fact that you know um, in this case Bambang Sujanto allowing me to photograph him to photograph him to visit him as his home to visit him at his work is also a kind of um, performance or a kind of uh, articulation of that desire to show that it is possible to be both Chinese and Islamic at the same time. And this takes a very concrete form in the building of a mosque like the Ching Ho Mosque in Surabaya. Over at Tuban, I met um, a gentleman, his name was Ren Bian Yong. Um, 1994, he married his Javanese wife and through marriage, he converted into Islam. So right now, he's known by his Islamic name, Agong Jogrifi Muhammad. Um, and my experience and encounter with him is a really unforgettable one. It's, um, um, it still guides a lot of my thinking in terms of how I approach photography. Because when I met him, he told me, in very emotional terms, um, his story of conversion and his experience after conversion. Because after conversion, he assumed that he will be accepted um, by the broader Muslim community. But what happened was that sometime in 2002, um, so, well, earlier he set up a kindergarten in a neighborhood in Tuban, in East Java. And sometime in 2002, uh, the neighbors, the Pribuni neighbors of the, of the King Garden uh, decided that they want to destroy the King Garden. So we don't really know what's the reason for their actions. Maybe they were jealous of the success because the King Garden was actually very popular. Um, maybe they were jealous of the success. Maybe they didn't think that a Chinese Muslim could provide proper Islamic King Garden education. And also he named the King Garden after his daughter, and his daughter happened to be a kind of Christian sounding name. So maybe they also felt that it was improper. But anyway, for whatever reason, they tried to destroy the, the King Garden. Luckily, the local authorities intervened and there was no damage done. But the incident clearly scarred uh, Agong's life. Um, so when he was narrating this story to me, he was at the borderline of crying. Uh, he was really emotional. And, and bear in mind, he is relating something that already happened in the past six years ago, and he was still very emotional. Um, and of course, relating something that was in the past six years ago meant also that I could not actually photograph what happened in the past. So the story is only related to me through his words. Um, so that become 
that becomes quite interesting. Um, why would he want to? Why 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 does he tell me this story? Um, and after the attack failed, he contemplated con converting back to Christianity. So he would force his wife uh, to cook pork and eat with him. He would sometimes beat up his wife with a wooden cross, but his wife was very patient. And in the end, she managed to uh, convince him to continue on his path as a Muslim. And eventually that's um, in 2008, 2008, I met uh, Agong. Um, on that year during Idu Aha, I followed Agong to visit his mother-in-law. So here you can see uh, Agong when he and so his mother-in-law actually stayed in a stayed alone in a village in the Grabang, Grabangan district of Tuban. So when Agong actually entered uh, her house, he immediately knelt down and asked for forgiveness. So of course we know that this is actually quite common practice. Um, you know, uh, especially during uh, days of uh, commemoration and hol uh, holidays. Um, but I cannot help but wonder if my presence with a camera actually made his actions more heartfelt. Um, again, bear in mind that um, what uh, he narrated to me um, happened in the past. So uh, there was no way I would be able to go back to the past and photograph you know, the, the kind of emotional scars that happened to him uh, when they tried to destroy his uh, King of Garden, where he felt that even conversion could not secure his uh, safety in Indonesia. Um, so I cannot help but wonder if my camera, my, my presence and, you know, my camera actually made uh, this act much more uh, heartfelt. Um, this is also something that lingers actually in my mind. Uh, when I reflect upon um, this body of work, perhaps he realized that um, by being photographed by me, um, he might be able to perform a certain kind of ideal that he wants to aspire as a Chinese Muslim. Okay. Uh, excuse me, uh, we've been get another 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. Uh, okay. Mm. <laughs> okay. Now, I, with the example of um, Abang Faiza, sorry, uh, with the example of uh, Agong, I will leave the Chinese Muslim project uh, for the time being and talk about the next project that I've been working on roughly since 2010. And it looks, uh, it's tentatively titled Small Town Stories. Um, I, I've changed the title quite a few times. Right now, I think it's titled uh, Living in the Shadows of Chineseness. But basically, it concerns the experiences of Chinese living in semi-rural um, and semi-urban areas of Southeast Asia because there is a common perception that uh, most of the Chinese uh, live in urban centers uh, and are quite successful as in businesses. And while that is largely true, there is in fact, uh, there has been historically uh, the presence of um, Chinese in semi-rural or rural areas of Southeast Asia working as fishermen, uh, working in um, agriculture, uh, and their stories are often overlooked. And so I began a kind of like long work to try to record their stories um, across Southeast Asia. And so this is a kind of like a rough um, um, overview of the places that I've been to. Um, I'm just going to very quickly show some images. So this is, uh, this project is still unfolding and these are some of the, uh, this is an earlier version of the work being exhibited in Singapore. In 2015, it was exhibited in Sabah Museum in Malaysia. So the work by then has changed. Uh, and then it was actually exhibited in Lianzhou Photo 2015 in Guangdong, China. And in 2016, we set up a kind of resource library in a gallery in Singapore. Okay, I will just talk about these uh, uh, two places uh, which I visited for this project. One is at Tangerang in West Java, uh, involving the China Benteng community in West Java. So the 
the common um percept the common story is that in 1685 the Dutch built a fort at the current center current town center of Tangerang, and the Chinese settlers who live around the now demolished fort began to associate themselves or identify themselves as China Benteng. Uh, typically, the China Benteng are people who are who who of course are many many generations removed from China. They are usually very dark and they didn't they don't speak any Chinese dialect anymore. So this is actually um, one of the old buildings that you will find in Tangerang. And even though they don't speak any language, any, uh, any of the dialects anymore, the Chinese dialects anymore, they, in their wedding rituals, they retain a certain kind of like, um, as you can see in the photographs, um, they retain certain very obvious Chinese features in their weddings. And what is really interesting is that um, the China Benteng wedding, because of the fact that they retain some of these so-called traditional features, it has become a kind of spectacle for the, the urban Chinese who are based in Jakarta. So when I attended the wedding of um, Un and Sim, um, I was also followed by a whole bunch of photographers and Chinese who came from Jakarta, eager to experience the, you know, the wedding with me. And in fact, in attendance that day was the Council General of China in Indonesia, Zhong Rui this is him. So when they were performing the rituals in, you know, the so-called traditional Chinese costumes, uh, everybody was trying to photograph the couple. But in the afternoon, when changed into the Western, so-called Western style wedding costumes, none of the photographers were interested. All of them went back home. Um, so here you can see the limits of or the potential limits of ethnographic work uh, in the sense that the desire of the photographer has a very strong bearing on what is being recorded and what is not being recorded. The photographers arriving to watch a China Benteng wedding desire to see a certain traditional kind of wedding. So when they are, when a couple is dressed in Western wedding costume, the photographers have no interest in it. Um, the China Bangtan community is very famous for, for creating a kind of syncretic music, which uh, we call Gambang Kromong in Indonesia. So during the wedding, Gambang Kromong would usually be performed. I will just show a little bit of the clip because I don't, in the interest of time, I don't think we have so much time, but I'll just give you a sense of how it, this is the modern style Gambang Kromong, not the traditional style Kromong. Let me see. Oh, to finish, yeah. For the, in the interest of time, uh, what happens here usually is that the China Bentang man would be dancing with the jockey, the, the local jockey, during a wedding. And the music that's being played is Gambang Kromong, as you can see, modern. This is the modern star Gambang Kromong. Uh, it's, there's actually not much dancing, uh, but actually a bit of uh, harassment going on during the, the dancing itself. Um, and what is really interesting is that um, I, I, I suspect the China Bentang is able to maintain as a communities many of their rituals, even though they no longer have the language, the fact that they are able to manage uh, to maintain many of their rituals and tradition is partly because this area used to be very difficult to access uh, in terms of transport from Jakarta to the area. And they also own the land that they live on. Um, they are typically still involved in farming and in rice planting. Um, so the land itself allows them to sustain many of their cultural practices and religious practices. But what has also happened is that um, urban Chinese uh, 
uh, capital, especially um, Chinese uh, real estate business has started to buy up all these farming lands. So the farm lands that once sustained the traditions of the China Benteng are now being taken over uh, without irony by you know, Indonesian Chinese property companies to develop large residential and recreational areas in, in Tangerang. And I suspect that will have a, an impact on the traditions of the China Benteng community. Finally, I'm just going to very quickly talk about one final example that actually haunts my work uh, on um, the Chinese living in the small towns and um, rural areas of Southeast Asia. Uh, earlier on, I so this is an area, I already mentioned this area is Sumanup, uh, which is the eastern part of Madura Island. Um, I actually enjoy going to this place, but this, this island is really arid and dry. Um, but um, here you find very interesting um, stories about Chinese who live amongst the Maduris community. Earlier on, I talked about you know, the family of Sajono at Legong. So that she also in Sumanup. But I'm going to go to another place called Le Longmos in Sumanup. And you can see at this cross junction, there's a small Kadai Runji, a small convenience store there. Uh, you can see also that these are, this is a really sparsely populated area. Uh, and then there's a Kadai Runji uh, at the junction. And so I arrived and then I began talking to Sumi Siati. Um, actually, a friend of mine brought me to see her because uh, my friend, who is a Madurist from Sumi, no, actually, she is from uh, the Chinese. So I started talking to her. Um, talk, I asked her about her family history and her family story. And then in the end, I posed her in front of her grandfather's house. So this is a really kind of like isolated, quiet place and um, where you know, she still lives in the house that her Chinese grandfather actually built. Um, but this photograph um, has come back to kind of haunt me because um, when I look at this photograph and if you look at this photograph, uh, if I don't put her in a project about Chineseness, there's no way you would think of her as related to my project. But by putting her in a project of Chineseness, uh, I kind of like, you know, return a certain kind of Chineseness to her identity, which may not be actually what she wants. Um, because we often ask the question, when will the Chinese become local? So there is, in, in, in this sense, my work as an ethnographer or photographer arriving at this location and, and photographing her, interviewing her, uh, of course, seeking permission to photograph and interview her, uh, and then putting her into this project. Does it also constitute a certain kind of violence where she's not allowed to become local? And not that far away from this house, you can see the family makam, the family cemetery. So this is the makam for the, you know, the cemetery for the people related to the family. And you will see people of, well, family members of different religious faith buried in the same cemetery. And so this is in, in, at the front, uh, you know, the tombs of um, Sumi Siati's grandparents, uh, you know, very Islamic star. So this image of Sumi Siati continues to haunt me. So with this, I will end my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Zomubin, for the very in-depth sharing session about your work. Uh, we would like to invite Dr. Fiona Lee to, to respond on the presentation. Um, thank you, Faisal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Faisal, for your introduction. And thank you to um, for the book um, Club KL and PSR for uh, inviting me to respond to uh, Wubin's work. And thank you, Wubin, for a really great uh, and rich presentation. This is actually my first time um, uh, seeing and engaging your work. Uh, so part of the challenge for me is also having to articulate my thoughts right away after listening to um, a very rich project. Um, so I see my role as a discussant, um, as offering uh, a response to uh, Wubin's work uh, by way of generating uh, further discussions um, 
uh, from uh, our participants here today, and I see there's already a question in the chat, uh, but also uh, maybe to ask uh, one or two questions to Wubin, uh, and maybe we can, you know, after I speak, Wubin can respond, and then uh, we can we can open it up. Um, and I thought I would organize my uh, responses uh, by way of talking about uh, one of the key words that was um, actually in your title uh, and that you kind of mentioned uh, towards the end of your talk, which is um, Chineseness. Um, so I'll say a little bit about this and then um, by, by way of that kind of engage with your work. So in my field of uh, cultural studies uh, in academia, uh, the word Chineseness has been used by uh, cultural studies uh, scholars interested in studying uh, Chinese culture uh, since the late 1990s. So this word has been around for quite a while. And the term Chineseness was coined uh, because I think we all think we know what Chinese means. But the reason for adding the ness to Chineseness uh, was by way of trying to foreground the idea uh, that culture is uh, a construction, right? It's not, it's socially constructed. It's always evolving, not something that is uh, fixed and unchanging and uh, inherited and, and kind of um, just passed uh, through time, uh, you know, forever and forever. Uh, and so uh, the reason why uh, scholars uh, insisted on this idea of uh, Chineseness uh, was uh, uh, for uh, two reasons. Uh, the first one being that it was trying to highlight that uh, power is always behind the idea of how we define something like, you know, what it means to be Chinese. Uh, and uh, this was scholars responding uh, to the idea that um, for the West, right, uh, China had always kind of been seen as the other to the Western imagination, right, so East versus West. And of course, within the Western imagination, there was always kind of this very um, uh, stereotypical idea of what uh, the East or China meant. And the whole construction of uh, China or East as such was to define uh, what the West is, right? And obviously to say that the West is uh, superior in certain ways to the East. Um, and the flip side of that also uh, is often that uh, for uh, uh, people who want to claim and identify with the term Chinese as well, uh, sometimes there is a, a vested interest in wanting to claim a very fixed idea of what uh, being Chinese means, uh, often also to defend against uh, certain ideas, right? And I think a very classic example of this is when we say, oh, you know, Chinese culture is against this idea of Western human rights. So in, uh, in Chinese culture, Asian culture, we are ag against these certain Western ideas. So that's a kind of a cultural essentialism. And so uh, cultural critics were saying, uh, no, we have to remember that, you know, uh, it's Chinese-ness because, you know, uh, how we define what Chinese culture is, is always a construction subject to change uh, and therefore something that is always uh, be um, uh, dynamic. And of course, the second reason for that is to remind us uh, that how culture gets constructed is through things like state discourse, uh, literature, language, film, uh, media, and I mean, of course, uh, in today's example, um, photography. Uh, and I think we see this, you know, example of um, culture as being constructed in the example of what um, Wubin called the photographic encounter, uh, because I think when he was explaining his first uh, project of uh, photographing Chinese Muslims, uh, you know, he explained, right, like um, he didn't want to just kind of uh, photograph a kind of a very uh, stereotypical image of what a Chinese Muslim is, but in thinking about how he was going to approach his subject, uh, what kinds of photographs he was going to take, he also wanted us to uh, rethink, right, what we uh, understand from the photograph saying, uh, you know, this is a Chinese Muslim subject. So the whole photographic encounter, the photograph itself, is in the process of finding and constructing what Chinese Muslim is, uh, rather than saying like, oh, okay, there's a Chinese Muslim subject, I take a photo and you just have a copy of that. Um, it's a more uh, dynamic process. So having said that, I think the follow-up point to thinking about, okay, Chineseness is to remember that, uh, you know, Chinese is not this one unchanging thing, but it's constructed and always changing, comes the question then of, um, 
uh, why talk about uh, Chineseness, right? Uh, like why even use Chineseness uh, as a concept? Uh, and you know, if we also think about Chineseness as something that is uh, multiple, uh, ongoing, constantly changing, it also means that there are very, very many different uh, ways of defining uh, what being Chinese is. Uh, and sometimes these um, definitions might uh, start to become uh, quite uh, contradictory. And I think Wubin's um, uh, you know, there were many examples of this uh, in, in Wubin's uh, talk. And so I think one um, uh, question that I had uh, for Wubin was also to think about, um, so what's at stake for you in trying to think about, um, what, uh, thinking about Chineseness, right? Why has this concept kind of figured so centrally uh, in your work? Uh, I'm kind of curious as to how uh, your uh, positioning uh, as a person, uh, I think of Chinese descent from Singapore, often going to uh, spaces within Southeast Asia, uh, you know, to photograph this. So what's, what's your underlying, um, uh, um, um, yeah, what do you think is the underlying drive that's in, informing why Chinese? And I ask this also because as I was listening to your work, I found myself thinking that, um, you know, that the photographs, especially the first part, can also be seen as um, not just interrogating what we assume what a Chinese person is, but also interrogating uh, what Muslimness is, uh, also interrogating what uh, pre boominess is, uh, right? So I, I, actually, the, the photographs actually do uh, interrogate, I think, our different cultural identity categories in, in multiple ways. Uh, um, and I, I'm wondering if our participants also saw that. So I, I'm also therefore curious as to, um, you know, what's uh, the underlying reason behind your focus on um, Chineseness. Um, and I guess maybe my final point would be um, to come back to that um, phrase that you use, uh, photographic encounter, uh, to remind us that um, what comes out of this work is not just the photograph, although the photograph um, kind of takes, you know, kind of is a centerpiece and I think actually um, uh, is the thing that helps to, I think, animate a lot of work. Um, I, I also wondered, right, if the photographic encounter is not just the, the encounter between when you as a photographer take a photograph of the, the subjects or the photograph. Uh, I mean, obviously there's also a, a lot of conversation that you have with them, a lot of interactions uh, before you reach that moment and then during the moment and after, but also um, like, can we think about the photographic encounter as a much more stretched out um, uh, event um, that also involves um, well, people like me who are looking at the photograph, right? Not present when you were taking the photograph, but long afterwards when we are looking at it, um, there's also the part where uh, you are in the process of putting it into a book or maybe mounting an exhibition. Uh, curators, publishers, editors, uh, maybe other people you're talking to are, you know, also coming into the picture of uh, deciding how, how we are going to look at the photograph, right? how we are going to understand the photograph. Uh, and that last example you gave of um, Susmiati, right? Like, you know, if I don't say or place her in the project of Chineseness, just by looking at it, we wouldn't know, right? That like, this is what I want us to see. So there's actually, um, it's not just the photographer and the photograph, but it's also, um, well, in your case, you, the photographer wanting to present your work, uh, you know, in relation to all the people that are involved in that production process, um, also, um, in, involved in that. So how can we think about the photographic encounter in that more expanded sense? Uh, and then the, the final, final point being, um, I am very curious also about the, the, the temporality or the time frame that you work in, uh, because um, we often think about photographs as capturing like that one immediate instance, right? That's what photographs do. But yet you are working in like a very long extended sense. Um, I mean, your second project was 2010 until, and it's ongoing. Uh, and I find myself wondering, um, do things change for you? Like in the last more than 10 years or so of thinking with your photographs, do you start to look at your older photographs in different ways? Does it inform your ongoing 
going, you know, upcoming photographic shoots and so on. So that last one being about um, time. But uh, yeah, so thank you. That was a really, really uh, rich talk. And I look forward to uh, the conversations that we will have. Thanks, Fiona, for your response. Faiza, should I should I quickly respond before we open to the public? Yes, yes. The rest we have okay. a few questions right now. <laughs> okay, I, I know I know this actually. Um actually um thanks for your remarks, um, Fiona. I can actually very quickly answer uh the, the second part in which um can the encounter be can the encounter be um uh, further drawn out? Actually, in fact, um when I teach, um I present a framework that's slightly different from what I presented today. Because today I'm primarily in the interest of time talking about my work as a photographer. Um, in my conceptualization, in fact, I call this a praxis of photography. I have this idea called a praxis of photography where the encounter is only in the praxis. And in the praxis of photography, there are three, part there are three parties. Uh, one is the photographer, one is the photograph person, and one is the users of the photograph. And this is where what you are talking about comes in. And my thinking is actually shaped by visual anthropologists who have long been interested in how people use photographs. Um, unfortunately, in the discussion of photography, particularly the discussion that is impacted or influenced by art history, there's always a singular focus on the photographer. Because of course, art history is interested to talk about, you know, the master, you know, you know, the great or the genius artist. Uh, but from the visual anthropologist uh, experience, we are more interested in, for instance, how the public uses photography. So in order to fold that into the equation, I kind of like propose a praxis. So that's where what you're saying is true. In fact, um, uh, photography is a long drawn event and it does not stop with the production of the photograph. In fact, it, that's just the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, what will happen is to some extent, when I look at my own photographs, I see them as public entities where, where um, future users will take the photograph and unpack it, even to the extent that it will contradict what I want to say. Yeah. So that, that answers the second part of your, your second question. In terms of the time frame, um, I'm sorry, I didn't actually make this clearer. Um, with, with Chinese Muslim in Indonesia, I spent 2007 to 2009. And what I would do is actually, I would revisit the people I photograph. So to an extent, actually, I spend more time with individual uh, photograph persons in the Chinese Muslim in Indonesia project. Um, by the time I come to um, Chinese in the countryside, rural, semi-rural and urban, semi-urban and rural areas of Southeast Asia, in fact, I actually spend less time. What I would do is actually I would come to a place, I do a short interview and I photograph them. Uh, and you're right because uh, however the project continues to unfold and over the 10 years, I actually have changed my mind uh, and look at and, and, and reflect on my work in a different way. Um, and today, for the benefit of the talk, I only focus on um, the, the, the part where I'm photographing. But in fact, there's another component that's come into the play, which is actually I'm um, going to the flea markets and trying to find anonymous photographs to reanimate them so that they provide a kind of context to the photographs that I'm making. So I'm trying to, in some sense, reanimate anonymous photographs that has been orphaned. Uh, so that's actually another component of this project. Uh, as I said earlier, photography and Chineseness is actually a long trajectory where today I have not really talked about my archival work aspects of it. Uh, and also in reading all Chinese language magazines uh, produced in Hong Kong, that's also a, a different project. Uh, but that also concerns photography, but not me as a photographer in itself, but analyzing photographs and photographic narratives. So yes, in fact, over the 10 years, it has changed. And very honestly, I'm kind of like a little bit tired with this project as well. So I'm still thinking how this should end. Um, for the, the first question, I think this requires a bit of time to explain. Um, how can I be quite succinct? Um, you're right to say that um, 
the project of the Chinese Muslim is an interrogation not only of Chineseness but pre-boominess or if, even you know the expression of uh, Islamic uh, Islamicness. Um, I retain the use of Chineseness partly because I'm partly because I want to signal the fact that I'm partially Chinese. I'm not full Chinese, in fact. Um, I have Batak. I have Batak. Uh, one of my ancestors is Batak um, uh, from Sumatra. So, um, but at the same time, I want to first of all signal the fact that I'm partially Chinese. And at the same time, I don't feel that I am in the position to comment about pre or or uh, Islamicness. However, with the Chinese Muslim project, it is quite clear that I'm actually navigating between how do you become or unbecome Chinese. And we of course know that Chineseness is on one hand a kind of analytical category, but also an experiential uh, uh, an experience in itself. Um, and growing up in Singapore, where the Chinese is the majority, very often we do not have to think about what it means to be Chinese, because we assume that 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 we assume that we know, or we assume that there is a Chinese that we can we can that everybody would know understand. It's only when I leave Singapore and I place myself or I position myself as a photographer. And the reason for me to do that is because I'm a photographer. I decided to self-fund this project, to do this project without funding and to put myself in a place like Indonesia and then to look at being Chinese or Chineseness from that position. And it's through that process where I began to also start to think about what it actually means to be Chinese in Singapore. So to use the academic phrase that I, th I, I prefer to use, actually, this is perhaps, you know, to borrow Chen Kuang Sing, right? Asian interreferencing. You know, I'm in some sense trying to interreference by practice. Um, yeah, I don't want to take up the rest too much time uh, because I think we do have some quite, quite a few questions. I hope I kind of more or less answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Ubin, and thank you, Dr. Fiona, for very, very intense sharing. And uh, can we go to the first question? Uh, the first question is from Alif. Yeah. He is currently a student of Master of Creative Art in Aswara, a local university. Uh, he asked, my body of work also related to photojournalism with the title of Liminality of Photography, The Life of Bangladeshi Migrant in Malaysia. I have a few questions regarding your body of work. Number one, how do you manage your time and money with your current work and your research? Number two, what do you look for to produce an image, how you compose and how many images you will took before you decide? Number three, how do you approach your subject to post for an image? What are the strategy to avoid awkward or rejection? And number four, why do you left out Philippines from your research area in your latest project? Okay, um, I will be, I'll try to be fast. How do I manage time and money? Uh, <laughs> if, you are, if you're asking me how to manage your money, then you're asking the wrong person because I, <laughs> almost all of my projects are self-funded. Uh, especially the Chinese Muslim project. So if you're asking me for, uh, for money advice, you're ask, definitely asking the wrong person. Anyway, I, I, I work uh, I work freelance. And so time uh, is something that I can kind of like manage because, you know, if I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I need money, I will do something to, you know, to earn some money. And then, you know, so, so there is a certain degree of flexibility with that. Um, but you know, like you're asking the wrong person for this. Um, the, the 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 good thing though is that um, working in Indonesia and 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 I mean, especially working in Indonesia and some parts of Southeast Asia, I think people are really helpful and generous. So 
it's not like I need to spend a lot of money actually as well. Um, what do I look to in terms of producing an image? Um, and um, how do I approach a subject? Actually, to I can answer question two and three together. Basically, I I feel that especially with relation to the Chinese Muslim project, uh, it's actually important to give people time. Uh, so the photography encounter is really very important for me. Um, whether I produce good or bad photograph is actually not a, an important consideration. The consideration is actually to spend time with people. And that's why I want to talk about the encounter because the encounter is crucial. Um, even if you don't produce any photograph or even if you don't produce any good photograph, the encounter still is really precious for both the photographer and the photograph person. Because um, as I want to propose, the encounter allows the photograph person to project or his identity to imagine a kind of ideal that he or she can show to you as a photographer so that's actually quite a precious experience uh how do i i mean and and in relation to rejection you always get rejected so just move on don't be too bothered about it um as a photographer you have to deal with that um you, we just move on because we know that there will be other people who will help us um and we want people who want to collaborate with us to work with us as photographers. So just move on and find another person. For the last project, I left out Philippines partly because I'm not so sure where, which is the place that I should focus on in the Philippines. Um, so I don't have an answer. I, I mean, my answer is that I, I'm not yet sure where I should focus on for that project in the Philippines. And in the end, there might be a possibility I will not do anything in the Philippines for that project. Okay. Thank you, Wubin. Uh, I think uh -huh. the second second question, second person question, uh, maybe uh, we can invite Dr. Fiona also to respond to it. So the, uh, the, the I think it's more in it's like pondering. The second question is from Salina Christmas. I, I think Salina is from London. <laughs> so um, she, 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 she uttered a question about number one is racial plea fluidity is race a choice number two dna test how does or could this help inform a person of his real or imagined gene gene genealogy number three is uh, race is social construct not just genetic what of those who are genetically of a certain ethnicity but choose another identity example speak and dress in a certain way and subscribe to a belief system. Number four, material culture, consideration on informant lifestyle or culture by way of consumption. Example, food, lifestyle, ceremony, artistic expression, or folklore. Example, Ramayan. Uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Fiona, you would like to respond first and then we come to moving. Um. I would say that uh, Salina's um, points, I think, underscore, um, like, illustrate, right, why, why um, cultural critics, you know, want to add the ness to something like Chinese-ness. Um, for example, we might think of, um, uh, in Malaysia and Singapore, for example, we often think of Chinese as a racial category, um, but obviously Chinese can also be a national category, right? Uh, you know, uh, hence, uh, if um, a, a Chinese Malaysian person would go to the West, right, and then uh, they say, uh, oh, I'm Chinese, and then they go, oh, you're from China. No, 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 I'm not from China. I'm Malaysian Chinese, you know, so, so Chinese can also mean uh, nation, it can mean ethnicity, but then comes the questions, example of if you don't speak any uh, Chinese languages, are you still a Chinese person? Uh, if you are a Muslim, have, if you've converted to Muslim, are you still a, like, yeah, it's, it's exactly like that. Uh, what we are calling Chinese, right, it's not something that is fixed, it's not something that is decided. And when um, the state or when any kind of institution wants to offer us a definition and reinforce it, uh, that's a power move, right? And, and comes like all kinds of ways of uh, trying to uh, question or maybe reinforce or interrogate, you know, why this definition uh, has been um, imposed or, or shared uh, with the world. And I think Wubin's um, photography, right, is in a way uh, a, a, a project and a process of 
uh, interrogating uh, where these uh, definitions come from, but also how does photography allow us to know <laughs> what is Chineseness and maybe also to uh, unknow, right, or question what we know, uh, what Chineseness uh, is uh, or isn't. I don't think I have much to add except to say that I think Selena's four points is already very clear in, in already pointing out the fact that what we are interested in, I guess maybe I can speak on behalf of some of us, is that we're interested in this idea of becoming or unbecoming. So Chineseness is not something that, or Chinese is not something that is fixed there to be, you know, to be referenced. And, and we're really interested in this becoming or unbecoming. Um, and one thing that I find photography particularly useful, uh, especially in this case where you, if I work as a photographer or, you know, as an ethnographer, um, is that it captures all these very individual experiences between myself, the photographer, and the photograph person. So there's a certain particularity in that experience, um, which to some extent resists the social science need to make a conclusion or make an observation. Of course, you can use the photographs to make a conclusion or make an observation. Um, that's one way where we use photographs as data, but we can also use photographs and recognize the fact that there's some singularity experience between the photographer and the photograph person. So if we go on that line, then we will know that all this identity performance uh, is at the end of the day, rather singular and particular. Thank you, Lutfiana and Ruby. Uh, I, I would like to invite anyone in the room right now, uh, you can ask any question in in any language so that we can help translate it if you want. Anybody? <laughs> you just, you can turn on the mic, don't worry. Uh, Faisal, should I answer Zihao's question first? Since Zihao Sure, asked, sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, I okay, sure, sure. Uh, so let me read the question if, if some people might not be able to see it. So I think Zihao's question is, what's your observation on the general attitude of your informants towards their Chinese names upon conversion, given the context of Suato's policy in the late 1960s to Indonesianize Chinese names and suppress Chinese cultures. Um, honestly speaking, um, this was not a question that I uh, paid too much attention to in terms of the changing of the Chinese names, because um, quite a few of the informants, um, I believe, they already had Indonesian sounding names long before they converted. Um, so I don't have something uh, very clever to, to say to your question, um, because actually it was not something that I looked at in detail. Uh, Wubin, uh, there's another question by Ali Aiman. How okay. do you find your subject? Do you have preconceived idea of the kind of person you want oh. to approach? Or do you try to seek out as many subjects as possible? Okay. Um, how do I find my subject? So that's a good question. So um, I first of all, I don't have a preconceived idea of the kind of person that I want to approach. So I, in fact, try to speak to as many people as I can speak to. But because my project requires so compared to a few work researcher who might be uh, just doing interviews and doing participant observation, because my work requires me to photograph and I, I want to photograph, I want to foreground the fact act of documenting. So um, it also means that uh, it is harder for some people to say yes to my project. Um, but what I would do is I would go to the Chinese Muslim organizations so I would start actually, I started in East Java where there is actually quite a good network of Chinese Muslim organizations in Surabaya and also in the smaller cities. I would go to, I would go to the Chinese Muslim, uh, I would go to the Chengho Mosque where some Chinese Muslim would use for their prayers. Uh, and then I would also ask my friends because I have at that point in time quite a few Indonesian friends. Uh, I would also ask them to help me identify uh, you know, people that they know who might be Chinese 
that's how I actually started uh, locating uh, the people I want to photograph. Uh, and then from the people I photograph, I would also ask for recommendations. So sometimes a Chinese Muslim would then say, why don't you visit uh, someone in Tuban? So I would go to some, uh, you know, to see the person in Tuban. So that's how I slowly find people who want to collaborate in the project. Thank you, Ruben. Wait. Uh, um, the the Fiona, I would like to ask for your perspective on the question on you know observation on the general attitude of informant towards their Chinese name upon conversion. The what what I read the question again, yeah. Sorry. What your observation on the general attitude of your informants? towards their Chinese names upon conversion, given the context of Suharto policy in the late 1960s to Indonesian Chinese names and suppress Chinese culture? Yeah, I don't have um, much to add, you know, on that specific subject, but uh, Zihao's question, I think, raises the larger point about, um, you know, when we, we often think about uh, assimilation, right, meaning uh, losing one's culture, right? Like, so Chineseness as being something you can lose, right? If you are asked to change your name. Um, and, but I think um, Ubin's uh, response earlier to Zihao's question in, invites us to think, actually, it's it's a bit more complex than that. Um, and I, I think even in some of the um, subjects that uh, Ubin photographed, like um, if you, uh, convert because of marriage, you know, are you losing something or, you know, or is that change, um, you know, part of that, again, right, the dynamic, ongoing, changing nature of what culture is. So I, I think, I mean, and having said that, I'm not wanting to den deny the fact that sometimes uh, there are power hierarchies at play, right, where people are being, uh, 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 compelled to change under circumstances where they may or may not want to, uh, and 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 that's also the complexity of of um, um, yeah what what's involved in all that change. So I, I think these are the various kind of uh, factors we kind of need to keep in mind when we think about um, assimilation, integration, uh, ongoing change. Uh, what are the different factors and um, uh, power dynamics that are involved? Thank you, Dr. Fiona. Uh, we have uh, two person asking questions right now. It's quite a lot. Um, the first one is, I, I think, wait, wait, John wait, Peter. Wait. I think John Peter. Peter. Uh, Pete, John Peter Chua. John Peter Chua. Um, oh, just, wait, wait, wait. It's getting me. It's moving. Maybe I, I, I can read I can read uh, his question. Uh, so John is somebody that I know from Philippines. So uh, his question is, um, there's a tendency in, so he agrees with the fact that my, my suggestion that maybe in social science, there's a tendency to look for conclusions. And he's, in John's case, he's a filmmaker and someone with a social science background. Um, and then there's a tendency for himself to create defined conclusions of Chineseness on his own identity. So his question is, as we are constantly becoming and unbecoming, what would be a good alternative to finding conclusive, seemingly stable identifications of Chineseness or any certain identity? What would be a more freeing option? Um, I, I, I don't think what, um, I don't think that, um, how should I say this? I'm not so sure in my work, I'm looking for a stable definition of Chinese-ness or any kind of identity. Um, and, and it is also true because I'm also grappling with this. When um, I title a project called Photography and Chinese-ness, right? it does seem to suggest that I'm trying to bracket these two ideas, photography and Chinese-ness which on one level is, of course, you know, the, you know, a way to bring these two ideas together. But at the same time, we have to be careful in the sense that 
um, it is probably more useful to intersect Chineseness with other experiences like sexuality or gender or class, education, uh, rather than just focus exclusively on the idea of Chineseness. I don't, I mean, so in a roundabout way, I'm trying to say that I'm not, in my work, I'm definitely not trying to find a kind of stable definition of Chineseness. What I'm really interested in is probably, you know, the kind of becoming or unbecoming or the performing of um, certain um, uh, uh, the performance of what you know uh, identities in the photographic encounter in itself and how that might intersect you know as i said gender or maybe even co war yeah there's a question by fang chun the second question is by fang chun <laughs> and actually i'm not so sure i understand the question <laughs> fang chun what do you maybe mean fang chun, uh, maybe fang chun can open the mic and elaborate more feel free to open your mic don't worry Hi. Oh. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um. So I'm just wondering, right? The do they actually have? Uh, is photography part of their daily life experience for some of the subjects? And if so, do they have a different way of using photography? And what do they use photography for? Okay. This question right now I cannot answer because at that point in time, this was done in 2007 to 2009. I actually didn't think that I could actually approach the project that way. So I could actually, so, but right now I realize that, um, you know, that there, there might be a different way I could, I could make this work by not actually photographing, but by using what uh, um, the Chinese Muslims uh, photograph on their mobile phones and how they see the world through their mobile phones, right? So that's another way where, where we might be able to think about their subjectivities as Chinese Muslim in Indonesia. But at that point in time, um, my interest was actually to capture some of these stories of the Chinese Muslims in Indonesia. Uh, and the broader context then was that um, we are a few years removed from uh, the collapse of Suharto. And only with the collapse of Suharto, it became much more easier to talk about different contestations of identities. Uh, and I was working with that kind of awareness that maybe I was trying to record some of the stories of this um, Chinese Muslim in Indonesia, uh, which maybe a decade or so earlier would be very difficult to uh, photograph or document. Yeah. We got one last question before we end the session. Okay. Uh, we got, question uh, by. Yeah. We got Adip. Adip. Yeah. Uh, he got two questions and a comment for consideration. Question number one, did the participant identify themselves as Chinese or did they use other Indonesian terms such as Pranakan? I uh, was also wondering whether the participants saw themselves as racially or culturally Chinese or if this connection was viewed in terms of lineage. Uh, question number two, have you considered expanding your project to include Chinese Muslim in Malaysia? And... Uh, there's comment, Dr. Fiona and Wubin mentioned the idea of Muslimness and Islamicness. It's, it's important to consider how Islam has become an identity religion in the context of Southeast Asian nationalism and religious nationalism. This tends to limit societal expression of Islam as the religion become understood in a way that are uh, culturally predatory. Okay, I think I'll quickly respond. Thanks for the questions, Adip. Um, to be honest, for question one, at that point in time, I did not actually discuss many of these very, you know, interesting experiences of, you know, whether they saw themselves racially or culturally Chinese. Um, I have to say that my intention at that point in time, and this is like 15 or 20 years ago, was quite um, simple, which was to try to record the stories that, that, um, that um, the Chinese Muslim experienced uh, at that point in time um, with the awareness that, that it was just becoming easier to 
first of all, locate people who want to identify themselves as both Chinese and Muslim or Chinese Muslim. And then to be able to convince them to allow me to photograph them uh, in, in this context. Um, so I actually did not spend time discussing with them their understandings of, you know, Peranakanness or maybe, you know, whether they saw themselves racially or culturally Chinese. Um, also, I was very wary of the fact that, um, as I explained a little bit earlier at the start, right, I was wary of the fact that um, because, I mean, this, I think, applies both to photography and also social science. Um, uh, I was wary of the possibility that if I looked and if I frame a certain kind of Chineseness before I begin the project, I would, I would, you know, then in some sense limit the kind of respondent in the project itself. So I took a very, very, very loose um, definition of what being Chinese was at that time. And I also made a deliberate attempt to reach out to Pribumi, who actually was quite happy to talk about the, the myth of their, you know, their Chinese ancestry. So actually I had a very open-ended uh, sense of what, uh, how or how someone could be included in the project itself. Um, for your second question, I have not considered extending the project to include Chinese Muslims in Malaysia because I think there are some people working on it, if I'm not wrong. Would you guys would love to comment on the on the Muslimness and Islamicness? It's important to consider how Islam has become identity religion in the context of Southeast Asian nationalism and religious nationalism. This tends to limit societal expression of Islam as the religion become understood in a ways that are culturally predatory. Does Vienna want to respond? Uh, well, I did articulate it very well why I brought up, you know, this idea of, you know, that Wubin's photographs can also be an interrogation of, um, you know, Muslim, Muslimness, Islamicness. Uh, it, it is precisely because we live in, in an environment, um, you know, Malaysia, after we have just come out of a GE, uh, you know, um, election season, right, where our political discourse uh, uh, talks in a way as if Chinese and Muslim are always opposite, right? Uh, in on different categories rather than something that one human being can embody both. Um, so it is precisely because we live in this environment that I think, um, you know, Wubin's photography like makes a question, really. Like, like, yeah, these two things can go together and maybe we have to rethink some of the categories that um, keep being reinforced in our uh, political social discourse. You want to add Wubin? No, no, I think, yeah. I, I think uh, Fiona has actually, I mean, covered the ground. Right. Okay, I think, any question left? I mean, uh, we already closed the question. Uh, I think that's all for tonight's session. Thank you everyone for joining us in the enlightening and thought-provoking webinar on photography and Chinese in Southeast Asia. Our exploration of the intricate connection between photography, culture, and identity has both captiv captivating and insightful. We extend to our deepest gratitude to our esteemed panelist, Zhuang Wubin, for sharing his remarkable work and shedding lights on multifaceted aspect of Chinese-ness through his lens. Your insight have been truly enriched our understanding of the subject. Uh, I would like to give some uh, Teaser that Wubin will be coming to Malaysia this December to uh, catch him out in, in person. <laughs> and a heartfelt thank you for our discussion, Dr. Fiona Lee, for your valuable perspective and have deepened our appreciation for the broader implication of this exploration. We also would like to express our appreciation to the organizer, Pusat Sejarah Rakyat. Last, our gratitude goes to all of you attendees, our, our attendees, your active participation and thoughtful question have made this webinar an engaging and interactive experience as we conclude. Remember that the dialogue doesn't have to end here. Feel free to continue exploring these themes and ideas beyond, beyond this virtual space. On behalf of the entire organizing team, I encourage you to stay connected 
follow the work of our distinguished panelists and organization and remain curious about the intersection of photography, culture, and identity. Thank you once again for being part of this journey until we meet again in the future endeavor. Stay inspired and continue to explore the diverse tapestry of Southeast Asian culture. Wishing you all a wonderful day ahead. Goodbye and take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Wu Bin and Fiona. <laughs> Thank you. Too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cool, cool. Okay. Of course, it's, it's good. It's great. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Maybe we should do uh, in person in December. We can do as well. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, we're going to Grand Kongsi, right? Uh, TBC, maybe we could explore another place. Yeah, we never know. We have MDA if you want. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Fiona Lei is part of MDA actually. <laughs> MDA. Russian Design Archive. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> really, I'm not, but I, I but uh, oh, I'm yeah. sure Sorry. If, if you want to. Um, but Wubin, I really enjoyed uh, your your talk and and, and yeah, um, uh, hope there will be more opportunity to engage and learn more about your work. Thanks. Thanks. Maybe we should, um, yeah, in December, maybe we should all, all meet maybe for a coffee or something. Sure, sure. Yeah, because I'll, I'll probably stay for a while. Yes, yeah. we, 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 could, we could do that. Let's, yeah. do, let's do dinner or something like that.